Chapter 15, Christmas at Four Winds. At first, Anne and Gilbert talked of going home to Avonlea for Christmas, but eventually they decided to stay in Four Winds. I want to spend the first Christmas of our life together in our own home, decreed Anne. So it fell out that Marilla and Mrs. Rachel Lynde and the twins came to Four Winds for Christmas. Marilla had the face of a woman who had circumnavigated the globe. She had never been 60 miles away from home before, and she had never eaten a Christmas dinner anywhere save at Green Gables. Mrs. Rachel had made and brought with her an enormous plum pudding. Nothing could have convinced Mrs. Rachel that a college graduate of the younger generation could make a Christmas plum pudding properly, but she bestowed approval on Anne's house. Anne's a good housekeeper she said to Marilla in the spare room the night of their arrival. I've looked into her bread box and her scrap pail. I always judge a housekeeper by those, that's what. There's nothing in the pail that shouldn't have been thrown away, and no stale pieces in the bread box. Of course, she was trained up with you, but then she went to college afterwards. I notice she's got my tobacco stripe quilt on the bed here and that big round braided mat of yours before her living room fire. It makes me feel right at home. Anne's first Christmas in her own house was as delightful as she could have wished. The day was fine and bright. The first skim of snow had fallen on Christmas Eve and made the world beautiful. The harbor was still open and glittering. Captain Jim and Miss Cornelia came to dinner. Leslie and Dick had been invited, but Leslie made excuse. They always went to her Uncle Isaac West's for Christmas, she said. She'd rather have it so, Miss Cornelia told Anne. She can't bear taking Dick where there are strangers. Christmas is always a hard time for Leslie. She and her father used to make a lot of it. Miss Cornelia and Mrs. Rachel did not take a very violent fancy to each other. Two sons hold not their courses in one sphere. But they did not clash at all, for Mrs. Rachel was in the kitchen helping Anne and Marilla with the dinner, and it fell to Gilbert to entertain Captain Jim and Miss Cornelia, or rather to be entertained by them, for a dialogue between those two old friends and antagonists was assuredly never dull. It's been many a year since there was a Christmas dinner here, Mistress Blythe, said Captain Jim. Miss Russell always went to her friends in town for Christmas, but I was here to the first Christmas dinner that was ever eaten in this house, and the schoolmaster's bride cooked it. That was sixty years ago today, Mistress Blythe, and a day very like this, just enough snow to make the hills white and the harbor as blue as June. I was only a lad, and I'd never been invited out to dinner before, and I was too shy to eat enough. I've got all over that. Most men do, said Miss Cornelia, sewing furiously. Miss Cornelia was not going to sit with idle hands, even on Christmas. Babies come without any consideration for holidays, and there was one expected in a poverty-stricken household at Glen St. Mary. Miss Cornelia had sent that household a substantial dinner for its little swarm, and so meant to eat her own with a comfortable conscience. Well, you know, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, Cornelia, explained Captain Jim. I believe you when he has a heart, retorted Miss Cornelia. I suppose that's why so many women kill themselves cooking, just as poor Amelia Baxter did. She died last Christmas morning, and she said it was the first Christmas since she was married that she didn't have to cook a big twenty-plate dinner. It must have been a real pleasant change for her. Well, she's been dead a year, so you'll soon hear of Horace Baxter taking notice. I heard he was taking notice already, said Captain Jim, winking at Gilbert. Wasn't he up to your place one Sunday lately, with his funeral blacks on and a boiled collar? No, he wasn't, and he needn't come, neither. I could have had him long ago when he was fresh. I don't want any second-hand goods, believe me. As for Horace Baxter, he was in financial difficulties a year ago last summer, and he prayed to the Lord for help. And when his wife died and he got her life insurance, he said he believed it was the answer to his prayer. Wasn't that like a man? 
Have you really proof that he said that, Cornelia? I have the Methodist minister's word for it, if you call that proof. Robert Baxter told me the same thing, too, but I admit that isn't evidence. Robert Baxter isn't often known to tell the truth. Come, come, Cornelia, I think he generally tells the truth, but he changes his opinion so often it sometimes sounds as if he didn't. It sounds like it mighty often, believe me, but trust one man to excuse another. I have no use for Robert Baxter. He turned Methodist just because the Presbyterian choir happened to be singing Behold the Bridegroom Cometh for a collection piece when him and Margaret walked up the aisle the Sunday after they were married. Served him right for being late. He always insisted the choir did it on purpose to insult him, as if he was of that much importance but that family always thought they were much bigger potatoes than they really were. His brother, Eliphalet, imagined the devil was always at his elbow, but I never believed the devil wasted that much time on him. I don't know, said Captain Jim thoughtfully. Eliphalet Baxter lived too much alone. Hadn't even a cat or dog to keep him human. When a man is alone, he's mighty apt to be with the devil if he ain't with God. He has to choose which company he'll keep, I reckon. If a devil always was at Life Baxter's elbow, it must have been because Life liked to have him there. Man-like, said Miss Cornelia, and subsided into silence over a complicated arrangement of tucks, until Captain Jim deliberately stirred her up again by remarking in a casual way, I was up to the Methodist church last Sunday morning. You'd better have been home reading your Bible, was Miss Cornelia's retort. Come now, Cornelia, I can't see any harm in going to the Methodist church when there's no preaching in your own. I've been a Presbyterian for 76 years, and it isn't likely my theology will hoist anchor at this late day. It's setting a bad example, said Miss Cornelia grimly. Besides, continued wicked Captain Jim, I wanted to hear some good singing. The Methodists have a good choir, and you can't deny, Cornelia, that the singing in our church is awful since the split in the choir. What if the singing isn't good? They're doing their best, and God sees no difference between the voice of a crow and the voice of a nightingale. Come, come, Cornelia, said Captain Jim mildly. I've a better opinion of the Almighty's ear for music than that. What caused the trouble in our choir? asked Gilbert, who was suffering from suppressed laughter. It dates back to the new church three years ago, answered Captain Jim. We had a fearful time over the building of that church. Fell out over the question of a new site. The two sites wasn't more than two hundred yards apart, but you'd have thought they was a thousand by the bitterness of that fight. We was split up into three factions. One wanted the east site and one the south, and one held to the old. It was fought out in bed and at board, and in church and at market. All the old scandals of three generations were dragged out of their graves and aired. Three matches were broken up by it, and the meetings we had to try to settle the question. Cornelia, will you ever forget the one when old Luther Burns got up and made a speech? He stated his opinions forcibly. Call a spade a spade, Captain. You mean he got red mad and raked them all fore and aft. They deserved it, too, a pack of incapables. But what would you expect of a committee of men? That building committee held twenty-seven meetings, and at the end of the twenty-seventh weren't no nearer having a church than when they begun. Not so near, for a fact, for in one fit of hurrying things along, they'd gone to work and tore the old church down. So there we were, without a church, and no place but the hall to worship in. The Methodists offered us their church, Cornelia. The Glen St. Mary Church wouldn't have been built to this day, went on Miss Cornelia, ignoring Captain Jim. If we women hadn't just started in and took charge, we said we meant to have a church if the men meant to quarrel till doomsday, and we were tired of being a laughing stock for the Methodists. We held one meeting and elected a committee and canvassed for subscriptions. We got them, too. When any of the men tried to sass us, we told them they'd tried for two years to build a church, and it was our turn now.
We shut them up close, believe me. And in six months, we had our church. Of course, when the men saw we were determined, they stopped fighting and went to work, man-like, as soon as they saw they had to, or quit bossing. Oh, women can't preach or be elders, but they can build churches and scare up the money for them. The Methodists allow women to preach, said Captain Jim. Miss Cornelia glared at him. I never said the Methodists hadn't common sense, Captain. What I say is I doubt if they have much religion. I suppose you are in favor of votes for women, Miss Cornelia, said Gilbert. I'm not hankering after the vote, believe me, said Miss Cornelia scornfully. I know what it is to clean up after the men, but some of these days, when the men realize they've got the world into a mess they can't get it out of, they'll be glad to give us the vote and shoulder their troubles over on us. That's their scheme. Oh, it's well that women are patient, believe me. What about Job? suggested Captain Jim. Job? It was such a rare thing to find a patient man that when one was really discovered, they were determined he shouldn't be forgotten, retorted Miss Cornelia triumphantly. Anyhow, the virtue doesn't go with the name. There never was such an impatient man born as old Job Taylor over harbor. Well, you know he had a good deal to try him, Cornelia. Even you can't defend his wife. I always remember what old William McAllister said of her at her funeral. There's no doubt she was a Christian woman, but she had the devil's own temper. I suppose she was trying, admitted Miss Cornelia reluctantly. But that didn't justify what Job said when she died. He rode home from the graveyard the day of that funeral with my father. He never said a word till they got near home. Then he heaved a big sigh and said, You may not believe it, Stephen, but this is the happiest day of my life. Wasn't that like a man? I suppose poor old Mrs. Job did make life kinder uneasy for him, reflected Captain Jim. Well, there's such a thing as decency, isn't there? Even if a man is rejoicing in his heart over his wife being dead, he needn't proclaim it to the four winds of heaven. And happy day or not, Job Taylor wasn't long in marrying again, you might notice. His second wife could manage him. She made him walk Spanish, believe me. The first thing she did was to make him hustle round and put up a tombstone to the first Mrs. Job. And she had a place left on it for her own name. She said there'd be nobody to make Job put up a monument to her. Speaking of tailors, how is Mrs. Lewis Taylor up at the Glen, doctor? Asked Captain Jim. She's getting better slowly, but she has to work too hard, replied Gilbert. Her husband works hard too, raising prize pigs, said Miss Cornelia. He's noted for his beautiful pigs. He's a heap prouder of his pigs than of his children. But then, to be sure, his pigs are the best pigs possible, while his children don't amount to much. He picked a poor mother for them and starved her while she was bearing and rearing them. His pigs got the cream and his children got the skim milk. There are times, Cornelia, when I have to agree with you, though it hurts me, said Captain Jim. That's just exactly the truth about Lewis Taylor. When I see those poor, miserable children of his, robbed of all children ought to have, it pisons my own bite and sup for days afterwards. Gilbert went out to the kitchen in response to Anne's beckoning. Anne shut the door and gave him a connubial lecture. Gilbert, you and Captain Jim must stop baiting Miss Cornelia. Oh, I've been listening to you, and I just won't allow it. And Miss Cornelia is enjoying herself hugely. You know she is. Well, never mind. You two needn't egg her on like that. Dinner is ready now. And Gilbert, don't let Mrs. Rachel carve the geese. I know she means to offer to do it because she doesn't think you can do it properly. Show her you can. I ought to be able to. I've been studying ABC diagrams of carving for the past month, said Gilbert. Only don't talk to me while I'm doing it, Anne. For if you drive the letters out of my head, I'll be in a worse predicament than you were in old geometry days when the teacher changed them. Gilbert carved the geese beautifully. Even Mrs. Rachel had to admit that, and everybody ate of them and enjoyed them. Anne's first Christmas dinner was a great success, and she beamed with housewifely pride. 
Merry was the feast and long, and when it was over, they gathered around the cheer of the red hearth flame, and Captain Jim told them stories until the red sun swung low over Four Winds Harbor, and the long blue shadows of the Lombardies fell across the snow in the lane. I must be getting back to the light, he said finally. I'll just have time to walk home before sundown. Thank you for a beautiful Christmas, Mistress Blythe. Bring Master Davy down to the light some night before he goes home. I want to see those stone gods, said Davy with a relish.